Chapter 13 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 13. During dinner, I told Kathy my day in a slightly edited version. The one thing I left out was the gunfire from City Hall this afternoon. She laughed when I described Paul Mazzetti and nodded with satisfaction when I told her about the meeting with the seven likely candidates and frowned when I told her about George Watkins having asked me to finger Jack Beitcha. When I was finished, she said, They're all scared, Tim. I've never seen so much activity around that place as there was today. Dan Wanamaker was making all kinds of phone calls, including one to that travel agent in the Winston Hotel. Kilmer? Uh-huh. And George Watkins kept running in and out all day long, both before and after the meeting. Trying to convince everybody he was right about the CCG, I guessed. So they could turn around and convince him. What about that man who tried to kill you? She asked. Don't you have any idea at all which one he is? I shook my head. Not even a guess, and that's pretty disgusting when you stop to think about it. Somebody tries to kill me, and the likely prospects are seven of my closest and oldest friends. Men I've known practically all my life. Men I've worked with for the last fifteen years. And I not only can't even make a guess as to which one it is, I can't eliminate any of them. Not a one. That's a hell of a thing to be able to say, Kathy. That I can't look at a single one of those seven people and know absolutely that he wouldn't try to kill me. "'How deeply are you involved, Tim?' she asked me suddenly. "'In what?' "'In anything that might interest this reform group?' I shrugged. "'I'm not directly involved in any graft or kickbacks or nepotism or anything like that, if that's what you mean.' "'But what?' she prompted. "'But I have lived here for the last fifteen years. I have worked at my job, and it's put me in contact with City Hall.' And there has been a lot of mutual back-scratching. That was inevitable. And look at the people you got involved with that way, she said. You just told me you couldn't look at a one of them and be sure he wouldn't try to kill you. I frowned. I don't see what you're getting at. They were the wrong people to get involved with, Tim, she said. Eh, I didn't have much choice, I told her. You could have chosen not to get involved. No, I couldn't. Everybody's involved one way or another. You've got to get involved if you're going to get anywhere in life. You mean, she said, that you have to be dishonest? That was a strong accusation and completely unexpected, and I found myself automatically in hot defense. I'm not dishonest, I said. Not at all. Look, Kathy, don't confuse me with the police. Their job is to find the criminal and see that he's punished. My job is strictly investigation. I'm hired to investigate, and it's up to the people who hire me what they do with the stuff I dig up. I play ball with them, and they play ball with me, and everybody's satisfied. What if you don't play ball? I laughed. <laughs> I'd make a fast 1500 a year doing credit checks. So you have to play ball, she said. You have to make a deal with people like these seven. Uh, you're making it sound a hell of a lot worse than it is, I told her. People get away with things with your help, she said. Without my hindrance, I corrected her. That's the same thing. No, it isn't. Kathy, nobody has ever come to me and said, Here, Tim, here's a couple hundred. I'm getting a kickback on that street paving job, and I'd like you to look the other way. If I find out about the kickback, I find out afterward. And if there's no point in raising a stink, I don't raise a stink. They still pay you off, she said. You get money from the city and from Reed and King and from amalgamated investigator, I said. It's on the payrolls, and I work for the money. Tim, she said, her face serious and intense, it doesn't work that way. It can't. You can't just say that your job is to have no conscience, and so people can't blame me for not having a conscience because that's your job. Either you're honest or you're dishonest. If you're faithful to the rules of your job, and your job is a dishonest one, then you're being dishonest. I am no more honest or dishonest than anyone else in the world, I said. I didn't particularly care for this discussion, and I wanted it to end as soon as possible. But she wouldn't let it go. You are, she said. You have a greater responsibility to be one or the other. I pushed back from the table and got to my feet. Let's go into the living room and talk about other things, I said. We're not going to prove anything one way or the other. I suppose you're right, she said wearily, and we went into the living room where we talked about other things, non-essentials, and at ten o'clock she threw me out. Tomorrow's another work day, she reminded me and I got practically no sleep last night. 
I kissed her good night, and she told me to be careful, and then frowned as though she were mad at herself for saying it. I promised her I'd be very careful, and then I went out to the car. It was too early to go home. I drove over to the new electric diner, and Al and I had a grand time talking about the gouge in the formica. That killed an hour, and then I went home. I got there about a quarter past eleven. The grocery store was closed, but one light was still on, and inside I saw Joey Casau cleaning the cold-cut slicer. I tapped on the window and waved, and he smiled and waved back. I went on upstairs. I walked straight through the apartment to the kitchen, switching on lights as I went. I opened a can of beer and then headed back toward the front of the apartment again. I opened the double doors leading to the den, switched on the light, and looked at a real mess. I had had a visitor. He had been sloppy, and he had apparently been in a hurry. My desk drawers were scattered all over the floor, emptied onto the rug. The filing cabinet had gotten the same treatment, and the file drawers, now empty, were stacked haphazardly in a corner. The chair behind the desk was knocked over, the books had been swept off the bookshelves onto the floor, and the phone had, apparently, for the hell of it, been ripped off the wall. I'm grateful for that last item. If there hadn't been any mess in that room, I would have settled myself behind the desk, had some beer, and doodled a while, trying to think. If the mess had been there, but the phone was still working, I would have sat down behind the desk and called for some law. As it was, I stayed just long enough to get a good look at the wreckage, and then I turned on my heel. I didn't even bother to switch the den light off. I went back to the stairs, shut the door behind me, and started down to call the cops from the store, thinking what a good thing it was Joey was still there. I was halfway down when the explosion rocked the house. I lost my footing, slid down the rest of the way on my well-padded rump, somersaulted when I reached the bottom, and came up hard against the front door. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker Chapter 14 Peevishly, Harkham said, You're causing me one hell of a lot of trouble, Tim. I'm real sorry, I said. I was still shaky and it was the best I could do. We were at the Winston General Hospital where a man in white had put some goo on my head. I hadn't wanted to go to the hospital since I could pretty nearly walk, but... Everybody had insisted. Now I was just glad to be alive and sitting down, and I didn't really care how much trouble I was causing Harkham. I'd lied when I told him I was sorry. Frankly, he said, I was with Sherry. I'm with Muscatel myself, I told him. I wasn't thinking yet. I wasn't even trying to think. Breathing was plenty good enough for me right now. Thinking I could do later. And old Joey Casal was dead. It was one of those stupid freak things. The grenade, that's what Hal Gans had said it looked like before Harkham had whisked me away to the hospital, had blown out the front windows, demolished the den furniture, and cracked the wall between den and staircase. It had also jounced all the furniture in the living room. It had jounced the sofa, and when the sofa landed, it knocked a huge chunk of plaster out of the grocery store ceiling. Joey Casal had still been bent over the cold-cut slicer cleaning it, and the plaster had caught him in the neck. It was beginning to look as though I was a dangerous guy to be near. It was now after two in the morning, and I'd been hours in that hospital. I had a neat new bandage on my head, and I was nervous and shaky, and they told me what my apartment looked like, and I wasn't ready to start thinking yet or to try to answer Harkham with any degree of sense. He sighed now and got to his feet and went over to the door. The man in white was in the next room where I'd been patched up, and Harkham said to him, Can Smith leave here now? Is he all right? The man in white, I didn't know if he was an orderly, a doctor, or what, came in and looked at me. He was in his late twenties and looked tired and serious. Uh, how do you feel? He asked me. All right, I guess, I said. A little shaky. You don't want to go to sleep yet, he said. Not with that hit on the head. Uh, stay up for a while, as long as you can. Drink coffee if you want, but no alcohol. I nodded. Come back tomorrow afternoon to have that cut looked at and the bandage changed, he said. Uh, okay. Come on, Harkham said. My car's out front. We left the white room and the white man and walked down the green-smelling corridor and out a back door bracketed with red-lettered signs. The sign on the inside said exit. The sign on the outside said emergency entrance. Harkham's car was a new Oldsmobile, two weeks old. Every June, when the prices on this year's model begin to drop, Harkham trades in last year's car for a new one at Hutchinson's Auto Dealers, Caddy Corner across from City Hall. And any voter who thinks he does that on his salary also thinks the world is flat and is carried on the back of a turtle. 
We climbed into the olds, which still had that squeaky smell of newness, and Harkham purred it around the oval to the street. We traveled a dozen blocks or more before he made a wrong turn and wasn't heading toward my place anymore. Hey, I said. I live back that way. I know where you live, he answered, but he didn't slow down or turn around or say anything else. What is this, Harkham? I live back that way. The doctor said you shouldn't go to sleep yet, he said. I can stay awake at my place, I told him. He gave me a sour look and went back to his driving. You're a menace to him, he said. You're a walking accident. I'm putting you in protective custody until morning. What the hell for? So nobody else will get killed in your place, he said. You can't do this, Harkham, I told him foolishly. Watch me, he said. And I was still too woozy and shaken up to fight it. I lit a cigarette and leaned back in the corner and wished the fog would clear up. It was too much effort to think or argue. Harkham drove downtown, stopped in front of City Hall, and walked me down the stairs to police headquarters in the basement. A three-handed game of Pinnacle was going on in one of the rooms beyond the main desk. Harkham sat me down at the table and said to the others, Here's a fourth for you boys. He's got a knock on the head, so he isn't supposed to sleep for a while. And he isn't supposed to go home either, not before morning. I can play double deck, said one of the cops. It was Dan Archer, one of the two who had come to the diner last night when this whole thing had started. And was that only last night? My God, it was. Harkham went away. Dan produced another deck, and I sat watching him as he tried to shuffle 96 cards. He was my partner, and he dealt a good hand, but I couldn't keep my mind on the game, so we didn't make our bid. I played till 5 o'clock, lost 7 bucks and change, and then I just couldn't keep my eyes open anymore. They promised to wake me at 8, and I went to sleep on a cot in the next room. End of chapter 14《Chapter 15 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. They let me sleep till noon. Then Andy Vicha, yet another one of Jack Vicha's nepotic relations, woke me to tell me someone wanted to talk to me in the office down the corridor. I was ravenous and had a throbbing headache, and I needed a shave, and the bastards were supposed to have awakened me at eight. I went grumbling down the hall to see who wanted what. It was Dan Wanamaker and George Watkins in person, in glorious technicolor. George was mainly red, and Dan was mainly green, but smiling. "'How's the miserable play, George?' I said. "'We wanted to talk to you, Tim,' he said, too upset to think about plays. "'Before you did anything,' added Dan. He smiled and smiled and looked absolutely terrified. "'Before you made any decisions,' he explained. "'Then you're too late.' I told them and started out again. Wait, Dan pleaded. Tim, wait, please. I sighed and faced them again. All right, what is it? Will you wait for Jordan, Tim? Asked George. Will you at least do that? Why? We know what you threatened. Dan started smiling, shaking. I interrupted him, saying, Not threatened. Promised. He nodded violently, the smile expanding till it damn near filled the room. He was ready to agree with me all the way to hell. We know you promised, he corrected himself, to work with the CCG if there was another try, but... And there was another try, I told him. George said, We can straighten it out, Tim, if we'll only wait for Jordan. Wait for Jordan? Wait till he comes back, he explained. I looked from one to the other. Back from where? They exchanged glances and George reluctantly said, Albany. I nodded. So, you tried Mazzetti and he wouldn't go for it. So now Jordan's trying to talk business with the boss of the outfit. What's his name? Bruce Wheatley, piped Dan through his smile, eager to help. He'll be back by four, Tim, said George. Will you wait till you talk to him? Why? I swear to God, I thought Dan would split his head in two with that smile. He'll be able to straighten it out, Tim. He said, I know he will. It's only four hours, said George, hopefully. A lot could happen in four hours, I told him. Please, Tim, wheedled Dan. He was sweating and growing greener by the minute, and he looked now like a beardless Santa Claus whose reindeer had just conked out at 30,000 feet, and the smile was like a saber cut with teeth. I chewed on my lower lip, thinking it out. I didn't particularly want to blow the whistle on this whole crowd, 
They were crooks, admittedly, but they kept a clean, well-run, up-to-date town, and I didn't see where the replacements, after a clean-up, would do much of a better job. If there was a way I could avoid blowing the whistle and still get the son of a bitch who had tried three times to kill me and succeeded instead in killing Joey Casal, I would very gratefully take that way. So I finally nodded and said, All right, four o'clock, at his house. Now George was smiling as much as Dan, and they were both talking at the same time. Fine, Tim. Good boy, Tim. You won't regret it, Tim. I knew you'd listen to reason, Tim. Sure, I said, but I still may go to Mazzetti at 4.30. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 16. The first thing I needed was food. I stopped in at the City Hall Diner next door to Hutchinson's Auto Dealers and had two cheeseburgers and three cups of coffee and refused to talk about last night's explosion with Charlie, the counterman. The next thing I needed was a shave and a change of clothes, and after that I needed wheels. So I grabbed a cab and headed home and I refused to talk about last night's explosion with Barney, the cab driver. The apartment looked just as bad as the descriptions had led me to expect. I took one look at the former den and carefully closed the doors on it. Somebody was going to pay for that, goddammit. And if that somebody had to be all of City Hall, that was just tough. It was while I was shaving that I figured out where and how the guy would try next. He had to keep trying. He had to get me before four o'clock. I finished shaving, changed my clothes, got screwdriver, pliers, and hammer from the tool drawer in the kitchen, half-filled a metal pail with water, and went downstairs. I walked around the building to my Ford, put everything down on the ground, and very cautiously opened the hood. A shoebox, sealed shut with masking tape, was sitting on the block. A ragged hole had been punched in the top, and a couple of wires came out through the hole and went over to the terminals of the battery. Cute. I went to work with the screwdriver got the wires loose from the battery, and with all the care in the world, lifted the shoebox out of the car. I turned like a man balancing full coffee cups and slowly lowered the shoebox into the bucket of water. Then I stood and looked at it while the bubbles streamed up through the wire hole. While I was standing there, I had a visitor. Bill Casal, old Joey's oldest grandson. A big and lumbering 24-year-old, two months out of the army. He was wearing army khakis and a white t-shirt. He was smoking a cigarette, and he looked sore. It occurred to me all at once that the Casal family, for lacking of a better target, might decide to blame me for what had happened to its patriarch. After all, he had been killed by a guy who was trying for me. But I was wrong. Bill looked at me, at the open hood, at the tools on the ground, and at the shoebox in the water. After a minute, he said, Another bomb? I nodded. He really wants you, doesn't he? He really and truly does, I agreed. We want him too, he said. You know that. You and me both, Bill. When you find him, he said, you'll let us know. I shook my head. When I find him, if I do, I let the law know. They'll take care of it. We'll do it better, he said. I'm sorry, Bill, I said. He pulled a wrinkled envelope out of his hip pocket and held it out to me. The family's hiring you, he said, to find the old man's killer. When you find him, you let us know. I looked at the envelope and saw a hint of green behind the white paper. I could picture the family meeting, last night or early this morning, and the hat being passed. The collection taken up. Bill sent to give me the money. To be sure, the Casal family got the man who had murdered old Joey, so he wouldn't be allowed to throw himself on the much tenderer mercies of the law. I'm sorry, Bill, I said again. I can't do it. He studied me for a minute and then shrugged and dropped the envelope on the fender of the Ford. "'You just, uh, let us know,' he said and walked away. I stared after him, everybody pushing me, everybody shoving me. I wasn't used to it, and I didn't like it a bit. I didn't open the envelope. I just stuck it in the glove compartment of the Ford, slammed the hood, put the bucket of water and bomb on the floor in front, and drove very slowly downtown. I went to police headquarters first, left the bomb for the lab to look at, and drove on over to the office. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker
Chapter 17 The burglar alarm wasn't working. The first thing I noticed were the new scratches in the wood of the door around the lock. I looked down at that for a few seconds, then raised my hand with the first key planning to unlock the alarm box. But I didn't have to. The metal front was scratched, bent out slightly by the lock. I pulled on it, and it opened. The wiring inside was a mess. Wires were showing that were usually behind a metal plate, and there was a lot of electric tape wrapped around wires here and there done slapdash hurriedly. Somebody had cut me out of the system, rewired so the alarm wasn't hooked up anymore. If they'd just cut the wiring, the alarm would have sounded at headquarters. But they'd kept the circuit closed by adding wiring and simply having the juice bypass my alarm. I didn't waste time trying to unlock my door. I just pushed on it, and it curved noiselessly back. And I went on in. The filing cabinet had given the guy a lot of trouble. It was dented and battered, and the face had been knocked off the combination lock. And finally, the guy had managed to slam the drawer faces in far enough to insert a jimmy or a crowbar. And he'd literally torn the thing apart. The smashed drawers lay around on the floor, emptied, the remaining files strewn all over the place. It looked like Fifth Avenue after a confetti parade. I sighed with relief, congratulating myself for having sense enough to move any of the files that might have proved useful to my caller. He had undoubtedly tried here first. Not finding anything, he had gone on to my place and tore that up. He still hadn't found anything, so he got mad and threw a grenade in the window after he saw me come home. Now, if I only knew which of those files I'd moved was the one he'd been after. The phone jangled, catching me off balance. I stared at it stupidly. And after a while, it stopped, but I knew it was just inhaling, getting ready to jangle again. In the interval, I took a second to wonder why he hadn't ripped the phone out here, as he had done at my apartment. I suppose he hadn't been mad enough yet to wreck things for the sake of wrecking them. Then the phone started again, and I stepped over a twisted drawer and picked it up. It was Kathy, and she was screaming, "'Where have you been? I've been calling and calling and calling!' "'I just got to the office,' I told her. I knew I should explain more than that, but I was looking at the wreckage that was supposed to have been an impregnable filing cabinet, and I was just a little too distracted. "'I heard there was an explosion,' she said, rapid and excited. "'I heard you'd been in an explosion, and you were taken to the hospital.' "'I just fell down and cut myself.' I told her. That's all. They let me out right away. I've been trying everywhere, she wailed. Your home phone wasn't working and nobody seemed to know where you were and I've been going absolutely frantic here. So I told her about my night and my morning and what there'd been so far of my afternoon and about Harkham keeping me in the clink overnight. And when I was finished, she said, Tim, I'm scared. I've been scared for hours, I told her. I thought about the bomb in the car, which I hadn't told her about, and I knew it was true. I had been scared for hours and I'd been too keyed up to notice it. "'What are you going to do?' she asked me. "'At four o'clock I'm going to talk to Jordan Reed.' "'What can he do? He promised you yesterday there wouldn't be anything else like this.' "'I don't know what he can do,' I told her truthfully. "'What if he can't do anything?' "'Then I go see Paul Mazzetti.' "'You ought to go see him now,' she said. "'You ought to see him right away.' "'I'll wait till after I talk to Jordan Reed,' I said. Tim, you can't trust these people. You can't try to get along with them. It's too late to smooth things over. I was afraid she was right, and I didn't want her to be right, so I got annoyed and said, I'll handle it, Kathy. Don't worry about it. I can take care of myself. Tim, please, listen to me. I'll pick you up at five o'clock, I told her. I'll let you know what happened. Tim, please. I've got to hang up, Kathy, I said. Tim... I hung up and stood looking out the window toward City Hall. Why had this all happened? Why had the whole thing blown up in my face like this? I would made the best deal I could. I balanced everything, worked to get along with everybody, worked to do my own job well and be both accepted and needed, and everything was going along fine. Everything had been going along fine for a decade and a half, and now it was all blowing up in my face. The phone jangled again. My hand was still on the receiver, and I automatically picked it up the second it started to ring. Then I regretted the movement, afraid it was Kathy again, with more of her fears and advice. But it wasn't. A voice like gravel said, Tim? Yes, I said. Jake Weitzer, he said. What the hell is going on downtown? Everything, I told him. Or do you mean something in particular? I mean Reed and that gang trying to crucify me, he said. I wouldn't be a bit surprised, I told him. One of them is trying to murder me, so I don't suppose they'd stop at crucifying you. Listen, he said. 
He sounded harsh and frantic. Listen, I don't like phones. Come out here. I gotta talk to you, Tim. Come on out here. Out to the candy store. I had three hours before my meeting with Jordan Reed. It might not be a bad idea to be up on the north side away from my usual haunts until the time to see Reed arrived. Tim, listen, he said into my hesitation. I always played square with you. You know that. I've done you favors. You gotta come out here. All right, I said. The candy store, he said again. I'll be right there, I told him. I hung up, stepped over to the demolished filing cabinet, and went out to the hall. I didn't bother to close the office door behind me. I was midway down the hall when the elevator door slid open ahead of me, and Harkham stepped out with Ed, Jason, and Hal Gans in his wake. I thought at first he had come up to see me, but the surprise and uneasiness on his face when he caught sight of me told me different. Hi, uh, Tim, he said awkwardly and hurried on by me. Hal Gans gave me a big smile. Well, Tim, he started. We found the... Shut up! Harkham had wheeled around and was glaring at Hal. Hal blinked and looked confused, but he didn't say any more. By the way, Harkham, I said, you might take a look in my office while you're here. Then I went on down to the elevator. Jack, the operator, was holding it for me. I stepped on board and we dropped toward the street. I wondered what Harkham had found that he didn't want me to know about. End of chapter 17《ハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピー I stood by the candy store while a couple of small fry made up their minds what to do with four cents, and then I told the proprietor, a short, shiny, spectacled, mustached little guy, Jack Vaitcha is expecting me, Tim Smith. M Mr. Smith, he said, the words heavily accented. Yes, he told me, go right on up, he pointed, through there and up. Yes, I know. I walked down the row of candy counters, through the door at the back, and into a room where eleven men with hats on their heads played poker at two large tables. A green shade over the lone window effectively kept out all daylight, and the room was lit by sixty-watt unshaded bulbs hung over each table. The air was blue with lazily hanging clouds of cigarette smoke. Coins tinkled and bills crackled, and the cards whispered as they were dealt. Nobody paid me any attention, and I kept going. A door in the right-hand wall opened on a flight of stairs. I climbed these to the horse room on the second floor, which was now empty and dark, these windows too covered with dark green shades. I walked across the echoing wood floor to the door of Jake Veitch's office. The door was closed. I knocked on it, somebody said to come in, and I went in. Jake Veitch was sitting behind an ancient wooden desk. Two other men leaned against the far wall on either side of the room's lone window. A girl, I recognized her as yet another Veitch relative, a cousin of some kind named Cindy, sat in the room's only other chair, painting her nails with fire engine red polish. Jack Veitcha perfectly fitted the part of the ward politician. From the hat shoved far back on a shiny balding dome, through the stogie in his face, and the white shirt open at the collar and the wide dark tie with the loose crooked knot, to the fat gut jutting out over his belt and the big soft hands unused to manual labor. His eyes were small and wide set, squinting now from the cigar smoke, and his jowls were heavy and beard stubbled, and for the first time since I'd known him, he looked scared. He took the cigar out of his mouth and pointed it at me. Tim, he said, and he had a slight trace of accent, though he'd been born in this country. Tim, they ask you to finger me. News gets around fast, I said. You turned it down, huh? Sure I did, I said. He grinned happily and nodded. You ain't working for them anymore, he said. Ain't that right? I've never been working for them, I told him. I've never been working for anybody except me. He stopped grinning. What is this? What the hell are you talking about? I could have asked him the same thing, but I said, I've never been one of that crowd. I've always been a free agent. I've worked with them, but that doesn't mean I'm one of them. Hell, I've worked with you too. I've worked with just about everybody in this town. Tim, listen, he said, and he was being very solemn now. Listen, this ain't the time for that jazz. There's going to be a war in this town, Tim, and everybody's got to line up one way or the other. I heard about you turning them down when they wanted you to finger me to the reformers, so I figured you were quits with that crowd. I figured you'd be coming over with Abner Korloff and me. 
Abner Korlov owned amalgamated machine parts where most of the North Side people worked. He and Jordan Reed had been bitter enemies for years. Reed had managed to grab control of the town, and Korlov had been trying ever since to get it away from him. You figured wrong, Jack, I said. I'm not picking any sides. Tim, he said. Listen, I'm in a bind. Up here, I know where I am. I know what the score is. Downtown, I'm lost. It's out of my territory. Things have been okay up till now. But there's a war coming, and I don't have any contacts downtown. Your whole damn family works for the city, I reminded him. He made a disgusted hand motion. Eh, they don't know from nothing. Everybody knows they're my people. Who talks to them? Who tells them anything? He frowned, then said, Cindy, you two guys, out a minute. Without a word, Cindy and the two guys left the room, closing the door behind them. Jack leaned forward, his belly against the desk, his face serious and worried. I got to know what the downtown crowd is doing, he said urgently. I was just lucky I heard about them asking you. That was just lucky. But I got to know what they're doing, what they're figuring. If I don't, don't crucify me. That's why I want you. I need somebody downtown. And I know if you said you were with me, I could trust you. Jack. Listen, he said. A deal. We make a small deal. I do you a favor, you do me a favor. That's all there is to it, okay? What favor? I asked him. You're downtown, he said. You know what's going on. If you hear anything that's got to do with me, anything at all, you let me know. I'll keep it under my hat. I, I swear to God, nobody will ever know it came from you, not even my wife. A personal favor to me. Jack, listen. Wait a second, he said quickly. I'll give you something back. I'll do you a favor. Somebody's been gunning for you, right? I nodded. You need a bodyguard, he said. You need somebody to watch your back, watch your sides. Those two guys that were here, I'll have them stick with you. They're good, Tim. They know what they're doing. The idea was awfully appealing though it might not be so good to have two of Jack's bully boys on my flanks. I don't know if I'll hear anything, Jack, I said. Everybody's scared downtown. Nobody's telling anybody anything. If you hear, he said. You don't hear anything? Okay, you don't. I'm not even asking you to go looking. Just if you happen to hear. And you got these two boys to help you. I nodded. All right, I said. If I hear anything, I'll let you know. But don't count on me. He grinned and leaned back in his chair. They're good boys, he said. They'll take good care of you. In what way, Jack? I asked him. He laughed. <laughs> Bodyguards walk in front, Tim, he said. That's their job. He hollered for everybody to come back in, and Cindy entered, followed by the two good boys. Listen, Vitya said to them. Tim's going to help us a little bit, and we're going to help him a little bit. Somebody's been gunning for him. I want you two to go with him. Make sure he doesn't get hurt. He turned to me. Tim, that's Ben, and that's Art. They're good boys. Ben was deadpan and simply nodded, but Art grinned like the Cheshire Cat and said, <laughs> You sure you need bodyguards, Mr. Smith? You don't look like the type. I touched the bandage on my forehead, and I thought of the four tries the guy had already made. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I said. End of chapter 18《Chapter 19 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 19 We went down to the car, and the one named Art, the grinning one, slid into the front seat beside me, while the other one settled himself in the back. I U-turned and headed back downtown. After a couple of blocks, Art said, "'Where are we headed for, Mr. Smith?' "'Get some insurance,' I said. "'Make your job easier.' He grinned some more. Jack told us you were shifty, but honest, he said conversationally. How do you work a stunt like that? I'm on the side of the angels, I told him. There aren't any angels in Winston, he said. He reached out to flick on the car radio. Mind some music? That's a police radio, I told him. All it picks up is squad car calls. He looked impressed. How come you rate that? He wanted to know. I'm on the city payroll, I told him. I could have one of those things from my house if I wanted it. Wow, he said in mock awe, and we rode the rest of the way in silence. I checked the rearview mirror a couple of times, and Ben, the deadpan one, just kept looking out the window at the houses as we went by. I wasn't sure whether he was being extra conscientious and was looking for possible snipers, or whether he was just bored. Downtown, I found a parking space half a block from the Winston Hotel. I've got to go talk to somebody in there, I told Art. You and Ben can come along as far as the lobby, but from there I walk on alone. Sure thing, Mr. Smith, 
he said. You're the boss. He unbent his lanky frame out of the car and strolled along beside me to the hotel. Ben kept a couple of paces behind all the way. Be right back, I said, when we were all in the lobby together and went on to the desk. I got Mazzetti's room number from Charlie, the desk clerk, and took the elevator up to his floor. I followed the corridor around a couple of turns and knocked on Mazzetti's door. He opened the door right away and looked at me as though he didn't at all like what he saw. I asked him if I could come in. He said, Yes, and turned his back on me. I went on into the room and was surprised to see his suitcase half-packed lying open on the bed. Completely ignoring me, he went on with the process of transferring his clothes from the bureau to the suitcase. I waited a minute for him to remember I was there, and when it became obvious that he wasn't going to remember, I reminded him, saying, I'd like to talk to you, Mr. Mazzetti. Go ahead and talk, he said. He sounded peeved. I wanted to give you a piece of information, I told him. If I can get a guarantee from you, you won't use it until and unless I say you can. Is that right? He said. He went on packing shirts, moving with the fast, unnecessary rough movements of a man about to boil over with rage. I didn't get it, and I didn't much like it. This wasn't the way I'd expected to find Mazzetti. I'd planned on telling him where the soup cartons full of files were hidden, if I could get a promise from him that he wouldn't make a move toward them unless I didn't call him at four o'clock. That way I'd have double insurance against any double cross from Jordan Reed. Because Jordan, after all, was one of the seven possibles on my suspect list. But the way Mazzetti was acting, he couldn't care less if I talked to him or left or flew to the moon. It wasn't according to my plan, and it annoyed me. Look, goddammit, I said. Are you going to listen to me or aren't you? He turned then and glared at me. Mr. Smith, he said, I don't frankly care what you do. You can... Tell me your little secrets if you want, or you can go to hell. I blinked at him. What the hell's the matter with you? I've been replaced. That's what the hell's the matter with me, he said. I'm leaving this fetid little town you love so well. I'm going back to Albany on the 315 train. He paused, glowered some more, seemed to think things over a bit, and added, If you really have information, you can tell the other man when he gets here. Who is he? I asked. And when does he arrive? His name is Daniil, Archer Daniil, and he should be here by seven o'clock. Seven o'clock wasn't much help to me, and if Mazzetti was leaving at 3.15, he wasn't going to be much help to me either. I'd just have to find somebody else to carry my insurance. Kathy, maybe. I thought of her before and decided against it, partially because I didn't want to expose her to the possible risk in it, and partially because I didn't want to expose myself to another one of her lectures. All right, I said. Thanks anyway. You are quite welcome, he said angrily, and went back to his packing. And I went back to the lobby. Art was still grinning when I got there. Guess you won't be needing us anymore, Mr. Smith, he said. I frowned at him. Why not? I called Jack while you were upstairs. He just heard on the radio. They arrested the guy who's been trying to kill you. Arrested him for the killing of the old guy in the grocery store. I couldn't believe it. I hadn't thought Harkham would dare blow the whistle on one of his pals. Who? I demanded. Who was it? A lawyer, he said. Ronald Laskow. Laskow? That stupid son of a bitch, that Harkham. He tried to palm the whole thing off on a fall guy. And he picked one of the few people in town I was absolutely sure couldn't possibly be the one who had been after me. Ron Laskow. Harkham must be losing his mind, I thought. He must be losing his useless mind. And then the other part of it hit me. It was on the radio and they were specifically mentioning that he'd been arrested for the murder of Joey Casal. The family. The Casal family. They were out buying the rope right now. I was as sure of that as I was that Ron Laskow was being framed. That's what Hal Gans had been going to tell me up there outside the office. And no wonder Harkham had shut him up, because Harkham knew I wouldn't go for that for a minute. I had to go over there and get Ron out, but that came second. The first thing I had to do was stop the Casals. End of chapter 19《Chapter 20 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 20 I knew where they'd be. Now that old Joey was dead, his oldest son Mike would be heading the clan. Mike and another son, Sal, ran a trucking company, and one of their warehouses would be the inevitable place for a family get-together. I told Art that I'd still be needing him and Ben. 
that Harkham had tried to pin it all on the wrong guy, and the three of us left the hotel. We hurried down the street to the Ford. Art joined me in the front again, and Ben, silent as ever, took up once more his half-asleep pose and back. Casal Brothers, moving in storage, General Trucking, occupied a square block on Front Street, down a ways from the Reed and King Chemical Supplies Corporation plant. On this square block were four buildings, all old and tall and dirty and red brick, three of them with boarded-up windows. These three were the storage warehouses and the garage facilities. The fourth building, which still had glass in its ground-floor windows, held the offices. The rest of the block space was covered with asphalt and used for off-street parking of company cars and trucks, most of it enclosed by storm fencing. I told Art and Ben to wait for me in the car. I didn't want Mike to get the idea I was coming to him with a show of force. "'You're a busy, busy man, Mr. Smith,' Art told me, in that half-mocking, half-impressed manner of his. "'Busy, busy,' I answered, and hurried away from the car toward the office building. I could feel Art's grin on my back. The girl in the front office told me that Mike Casal and the four other Casal brothers and a few other people were all over in the south building, but she wasn't sure I could get in to see them. I thanked her, told her I'd just stroll over and see for myself, and went back out to the sidewalk. The south building was right next door, but the entrance to it was around and back. I went through the passageway between the two buildings, turned the corner, and there was Bill Casal standing by the door, his arms folded across his chest, still wearing the khakis and t-shirt. "'Your father inside?' I asked him. "'He's busy right now, Tim,' he said. "'I want to talk to him, Bill. He's making a mistake.' Bill didn't move a muscle. I was an outsider, not family, and only family could be trusted right now. "'Let him decide that for himself.' he told me. Bill, for Christ's sake, I'm on your side. You know that, for Christ's sake. Let me in to talk to your father. What about? Ron Laskow didn't kill your grandfather, I told him. The radio said he did. And the newspaper said Dewey was president. Harkham's looking for a fall guy, that's all. This whole thing is mixed up with politics, and Harkham can't afford to dig too far. That isn't what the radio said, he insisted. The radio said he tried to kill you because you found out about some sort of crooked tax deal he was trying to work up and he was afraid you'd tell this reform group in town. So now I knew why they'd picked Ron. They were going to try to make him stand double duty. The tax scheme was out the window, so they would make Ron do for the murder and also try to make him bear the brunt of the CCG investigation. And he was too recently one of the boys to be able to do much damage to them. It's a frame-up, I said. Ron didn't kill anybody. The radio said he did, he said doggedly. For Christ's sake, I shouted. What is the goddamn radio, the voice of God? Harkham had to find a patsy, that's all. Bill, quit fooling around and let me talk to your father. He shook his head. Nobody goes in, he told me. That's what they said, nobody goes in, and that includes you. Bill, I said desperately. Would I try to cover for Ron if he really was the guy who'd been trying to kill me? There were four goddamn tries on my life, Bill. Use your goddamn head. You could be wrong, he said. And I could be right, I told him. He thought it over for a minute, and finally he said, mm, Wait here. I'll be right back. I'll wait, I promised him. He went inside, and I heard the click of the door locking after him. I lit a cigarette and looked around at the parking lot. It was full, jammed with Casal Brothers, trucks, and with private cars. It looked as though the whole family must be inside, plus all the truckers working for the company. A small army. Enough to take Ron out of our rickety clink and hang him from one of the City Hall Park trees and Harkham wouldn't exactly overexert himself to keep Ron from being lynched. The murderer dead, saving the delicacy and embarrassment of a trial. Everything solved and everybody happy. Bill was gone only a minute or two. When he came back, he closed the door carefully behind him, looked at me, and shook his head. He said no. Tell him to come out here then, I said. I've got to talk to him. He said no, Bill told me doggedly. This is family business and you stay out of it. And the hell I would, too. I made a big show of reluctant departure, then scooted back down the alleyway to the street, Bill watching me every minute. I turned the corner, went back into the office building, and said to the girl, Mike sent me for a grammet. A what? He told me where it is, I said, barreling around her desk. Upstairs in the second flotsam on the right. I left her gaping at me, went through a door, down a hall, and up a flight of stairs. I knew these buildings. I probably knew them better than Mike Casal did. He had only been occupying the place for nine years, and before that it had been empty, and a bunch of car parts stealing kids had used it as a base. They had had hubcaps and mufflers and tailpipes hidden all over the place. Fred Hutchinson of Hutchinson's Auto Dealers had hired me to stop the thievery, 
and as a result of it, I'd been all through these four buildings many times. On the second floor, I turned right and found the wall I wanted, blocked by three high stacks of cartons. I was alone up here. It looked as though the whole crew was next door, tying the knot in the rope. So I moved the cartons, which took a few minutes I didn't want to spare and most of my energy as well, and then I poked and pried at the plasterboard that covered the entrance. Here on the second floor, there was an old enclosed walkway between the two buildings. It had grown too rickety to be safe way back before the war, so both entrances had simply been covered with plasterboard and the walkway forgotten. This is where the kids had stored a lot of their loot. By walking very slowly and carefully, precisely in the middle of the walkway, so my weight would be on the main beam, it was just barely possible for a chunky type like me to get across to the other building and lean against the plasterboard over there which led me to a dark, dusty, debris-filled, abandoned little storeroom with a solid and very securely locked door. All that physical labor for nothing. No, not exactly. For I heard Mike Casal's voice saying, Then you guys with Sal go through those ground floor windows around on the west side. And the voice was coming from my right. I headed that way, covered my hand with black crisscrosses by touching a ventilator grill, and said, Damn. Mike's voice said, What? What the hell was that? Not only could I hear him, he could hear me. And this, come to think of it, might be even better than face-to-face -face contact. No chance of his tying me up and leaving me here while he and his army went off to raise hell at City Hall. Mike! I shouted. Who the hell is that? he demanded. Where are you? Another voice fainter said. It's coming from the ventilator, Mike. There's somebody in the building! shouted another voice. Mike! I hollered. This is Tim Smith. I want to talk to you. Find that stupid bastard, said Mike. That's it, Mike, I said. Waste your time. I want to talk to you, and I don't talk until everybody's in that one room. Where the hell is he? cried a voice. He can see us, for God's sake. Just go on thinking that, buddy, I thought happily, and said. Let me know when you're ready to listen, Mike. Come out here and talk face to face, Tim, he snapped. Sure, I said, and laughed at him. If it's about Ron Laskow he said. You're wasting your time. And you're wasting your lives, I told him. Ron didn't kill Joey. How come he's in jail for it? He's the fall guy. Crap. You don't want to make a mistake, Mike, I said. You want to be sure you know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing, he said. You ought to listen to me, Mike. I know more about this than you do. Another voice, Mike's brother Sal, I thought, said, We can't move till after dark anyways, Mike. Let's hear what he has to say. It won't make any difference, said a voice I didn't recognize. He's just covering for Laskow. They're buddies. I wouldn't cover for a guy who tried four times to kill me, I said. All right, said Mike. I'll listen. Come on out here and talk. I'll stay here, Mike, if you don't mind. I trust you, but I think you got some firebrands there. Say what you gotta say, then, he said grumpily. And don't stall around forever. So I leaned up against the wall, my mouth inches from the ventilator grill, and hollered for a while. I told them that Ron was being framed, and I told them why. I pointed out that the first attempt on my life had been made the night before Ron had even heard about the CCG, and that he and I had talked to the CCG representative together, and Ron had known he had nothing to fear from me. When I was finished, there was silence for a minute, and I suddenly had the fear they'd all left while I'd been talking, that I was now all alone in this building, shouting out a long story with nobody around to hear me. Then Mike said, slowly, How do I know you're right? You... Sound right. You got a good line, but how do I know? So he was still there, after all. Because, I told him, this is my business. Because I've been looking for the killer for the last two days. And if it had been Ron, I'd have known about it long before this. And because you know how I felt about your father. Another long silence. Only this time I could hear the faint buzz of whispering. Then Mike came back. All right, he said. You've made your point. I'm glad to hear it. I said. One thing, he said. We're still holding the rope. You point the finger, he's ours. I really didn't care who he was, so I wasn't about to argue the point. But there was a way I could now kill two birds with one stone. I wanted Mike to know for sure he could depend on me. And I wanted a sideman I could trust more than Art and Ben. So I said, I tell you what, Mike. You give me Bill there. He can travel with me, see what I'm doing. And the minute I know for sure who it is, I'll give him the word. All right? The conference was briefer this time, and then Mike said, You're on. My car's in front of your office, I said. End of chapter 20.
Chapter 21 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 21. Art was alone in the car when I got back. I slid in behind the steering wheel and said, Where's Ben? I sent him for some cigarettes. He grinned and pulled a pack of cigarettes out of his pocket. Lighting one, he said, I wanted to say one or two words to you in private. What kind of words? Words that wouldn't get back to Jack Bitecha. Such as? He seemed to think it over for a minute. At last, he said, I like you, Mr. Smith. I've heard some about you. Before this, and I like what I heard. Shifty but honest. Everything's going to get jounced around in this town, but I have the feeling you're going to come out on top. I hope so, I said. He glanced out the window. I wouldn't trust Jack Bitecha very far if I were you, he said. I don't tend to. It would probably help if you had somebody close to him to let you know what's going on. It would be at that. You applying for the job? He nodded, still looking out the window. Why? I asked him. I like you, Mr. Smith, he said again. He looked back at me and grinned. And I like to be with the guy who comes out on top. Here comes Ben, I warmed him. Is that a deal? He asked me. What do you want in trade? He shrugged. I'm a very useful type, Mr. Smith. Whoever runs this town after this whole mess blows over would be able to use me. And you could be my character reference. That's all? All. Oh. Could I trust him? What the hell had made him offer the deal? But it didn't matter. I could agree and no harm done whether I could trust him or not. And what good would it do me to say no? Ben opened the back door on the street side, then... Slid in, reaching over to hand Art the pack of cigarettes. I said, Then I think it's okay. Fine, he said. Thanks for the cigarettes, Ben. The other back door swung open, and I looked around to see Bill Casal climbing in. Good to see you again, Bill, I said. He was as deadpan as ever. Where were you hiding out, Tim? He asked me. Remind me to tell you sometime. Bill Casal, this is Art, and that's Ben. They grunted at one another, and I started the ford. Art said, where do we go from here, Mr. Smith? Make another stab at getting that insurance, I told him. And whether I liked it or not, the insurance was going to have to be underwritten by Kathy. End of chapter 21。Chapter 22 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Read by Ben Tucker。Chapter 22 。Kathy was boiling, with that combination of fury and terror that only women really have down pat. I should have spent a while reassuring her, and apologizing to her for making her worry and all that jazz, but I just didn't have the time or the patience for it. Yell at me later, Kathy, I told her. I've got too many other things to do right now. She stopped her yelling and studied me for a minute. I want to know where you are, she said at last. I want to know what's happening to you and what you're doing and I want to hear about it from you. I don't want to come to work in the morning and have somebody else tell me you were involved in an explosion last night and spent all morning going out of my mind trying to find out where you are and how badly you're hurt and what's happened to you. I want you to call me. Kathy, I've been running around town like a madman. I haven't had time. Be quiet for a minute, she said. She wasn't yelling now, and she wasn't acting enraged. Instead, two high spots of color on her cheeks were the only physical signs that she was holding anger in. That and her eyes and voice, both of which were cold and hard. I care about you, Tim, she said quietly, as though stating a rather unimportant fact. I care about you, and so I want to know whether or not you're all right and safe. And I want to know that you care about me. Well, for God's sake, Kathy, I... Just a minute, she said. If you care for me, you'll want to spare me the kind of morning I spent today. If it's at all possible for you to do so. If you care for me, you will want to know that I am all right. Kathy, look, if I don't mean anything to you, she went on, ignoring my interruption, then just say so. Just say so right now, and we're finished. You don't worry about me, and I don't worry about you, and... Kathy, wait, I said. I leaned down over the desk, taking her hands. Listen, just because you're mad at me, don't throw the whole thing away. This last couple of days, I've been on the run in half a dozen different directions. Not sure what's going to happen next. And I've been having trouble enough trying to think fast enough about all that's been going on. 
without trying to live a normal life on the side as well. A normal life? Tim, I simply ask that you call me. Okay, I said. I should have called you, and I didn't. I haven't been thinking about you as much as I should. For God's sake, Kathy, I haven't been thinking about me as much as I should. Wait till this goddamn thing is over, will ya? Don't expect me to act the way I normally would under circumstances like this. She shook her head. I don't see why you couldn't just pick up the telephone and call me, she said. Because I didn't think of it, God damn it! Because I'm trying to think of half a million things at once, and I didn't think about calling you. You want to make a whole soap opera out of it, for Christ's sake, go ahead. But at least wait until the thing is settled. She nodded, but from the expression on her face, I could tell she wasn't convinced. All right, she said. You didn't come here simply to see me. You don't have time for things like that. You came here because you want something from me. What is it? If I hadn't ignored the implication, we would have been off into another dandy little squabble. So instead, I answered the question. I have some files hidden, out at Joey Casal's grocery store. They're my ace in the hole. I want you to know where they are. If you don't hear from me by 7 o'clock, you go to the Winston Hotel and ask for a guy named Daniil. Archer Daniil. You got the name? Her eyes were widening, but she didn't say anything, only nodded. You tell him where you can find the files, I said, if you don't hear from me before 7 o'clock. If you do hear from me, you won't have to do anything, all right? Tim, what are you going to do? Listen now, I said. The files are in two tomato soup cartons, in the storeroom at the back of the grocery store, to the right as you face the front of the store. Have you got that? What are you going to do? I have an appointment with Jordan Reed. I told her. I want the word to get around that I have insurance, that killing me won't stop those files from going to the CCG. Tim. She was going to start the other routine now. She was going to be afraid for me out loud. I didn't have time for that either. I'll see you sometime before seven, I said, and headed for the door. She talked at my back until I was out of the office. I was afraid she'd follow me out to the hall, but she didn't. I took the creaky old elevator back downstairs, left City Hall, and returned to the car and my three cronies. It was nearing four o'clock. I made a U-turn and drove toward Jordan Reed's place. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker Chapter 23 If you look at a map of the town of Winston, it will probably strike you right away that the town is shaped like a balloon on a string, and if you happen to know the particulars of the case, the symbolism of that won't escape you. The balloon itself is the main area of the town, the business and residential and industrial districts. The string is a two-lane blacktop road headed northwest into the Adirondacks called McGraw's Market Road. I doubt that anybody anymore knows who McGraw was or what kind of market he had. And at the end of the string, where the owner of the balloon would be holding it, that's where Jordan Reed's estate is. Reed bought the estate around 20 years ago, and at the time the place was a good five miles from the city line, which meant it wasn't hooked up to the town's sewage system or water mains, and the county rather than the city had the responsibility for keeping McGraw's Market Road free of potholes and frost heaves. Two years after Reed moved in, the city council unanimously agreed that that five-mile stretch of McGraw's Market Road was really a part of Winston, after all. The house itself was set back a quarter mile from the road on a slim plateau midway up Claridge Mountain. The whole plateau, maybe a couple of miles long and a half a mile wide, was the Reed Estate, heavily forested and securely fenced. One turned right from McGraw's Market Road, past two massive stone gate posts, and dead ahead a quarter of a mile on blacktop through the trees to the house. The house was one of those big rambling monstrosities built at a time when bay windows and corner towers and rococo wood curlicues were all the rage. The first floor exterior was of stone, the two floors above it faced with gray shingles, the roof slanted this way and that over the various wings and outcroppings of the place and a wide screened porch surrounded the first floor on three sides. I pulled the ford onto the dirt beside the house, where guests were supposed to park, told my crowd to wait for me, and walked over to the house. The porch was cool and dim, woven straw rugs crackled underfoot, 
and whitewashed tables and chairs were off to the left, with an old crank em up phonograph, which now, its guts removed, served as a liquor cabinet. I rang the bell and waited, listening to the silence. The trees were rustling a little bit, but that was all the noise there was in the world. A maid opened the door finally and said, Mr. Smith, yes, Mr. Reed said you'd be calling. This way, please. I followed her inside and through the long, cool rooms. Jordan Reed himself was the modern businessman, dressed to the minute, completely up-to-date in both his business and social life. His plant was so modern it was painful. But his home was a cool, dim breeze straight out of the 19th century. We walked back through the house, through rooms muffled by deep-piled oriental carpets, the wall mirrors gleaming dark, the rich woods of the furniture burnished to warm highlights, the ceilings high and dim, the walls papered with gentlemen and ladies riding in carriages or sitting quite formally in tiny rose arbors. There were no halls or corridors in this house, at least not on the first floor. One simply walked from room to room through doorways graced with heavy, polished, intricately carved doors. I half expected to see Marvin Reed lurking in a corner of one of these rooms, still hiding from the by-now-departed Paul Mazzetti. But aside from the stolidly waddling maid, I saw no one, not Marvin or his wife Allison or any other servants. We stopped finally before one of the most rococo doors this side of the nearest cathedral, and the maid tapped diffidently on a curlicue. A muffled sound from inside might have been instructions to enter. The maid opened the door, ushered me in, closed the door again and presumably went away. This was Jordan Reed's den, and a fantastic room it was. For some reason, that den always seemed to emphasize my chunkiness. The wall directly opposite me as I walked in was almost completely glass, two high, wide windows looking out across the cleared side lawn and down the long forested slope of Claridge Mountain to the valley, where the whole town was laid out like a model on a tabletop. Between the windows was a six-foot-wide strip of wall dominated by a frowning, dark, gloomy oil painting of Jordan Reed's father, Jonas, who, with Michael King, founded Reed and King Chemicals back before the turn of the century. The entire left wall, side to side and floor to ceiling, was lined with bookshelves, with the old Morocco-bound matched sets on the upper shelves, leading down through grim-colored texts on business and finance, an American tax structure through gaily dusted jacketed novels bought by Jordan's late wife via mail-order book clubs, down to the bottom shelf way over on the right where red and yellow paperback books were not quite hidden from view. The right-hand wall held photographic blow-ups of the Reed and King plant and various members of both families over a leather davenport, a couple of ashtray stands and a well-stocked liquor cabinet. Brown leather armchairs flanked the doorway, with a map of Winston on the wall to the left of the door and a genealogical chart of the Reed clan to the right. In the center of all of this was a huge U-shaped desk, custom made to Jordan Reed's own plans with Reed himself at the chair in the middle of the U, sitting with a loose-leaf notebook open in front of him, making notations in it from a sheet of paper to his right. He looked up at my entrance, his face bland and smiling. "'Ah, Tim,' he said, getting to his feet and backing out of the U. "'Scotch?' he asked me. "'Or rye?' Neither, I said. Talk. He frowned, paused midway to the liquor cabinet studying me. All right, he said. Sit down, Tim. I'll stand. Oh, come on, Tim, don't have a chip on your shoulder. I had expected him to be just a little bit worried. This bland good humor had me worried. Do you remember, I asked him, what I promised yesterday? He nodded. Of course, he said, and continued on to the liquor cabinet. You threatened to go to the CCG, he said, if there were any more attempts on your life. And there was another one last night, I said. Wanamaker and Watkins asked me to wait until I talked to you. He nodded and mixed himself a drink, moving slowly, and not looking at me again until the drink was ready. Then he glanced over and said, You waited, and it's a good thing you did, since now it's pretty plain you had the wrong idea. Which wrong idea was that? That it was one of the people at that meeting he said, behind the bland smile he was watching me. I held it in, trying to be as matter-of-fact as possible. That isn't pretty plain to me, I said. He did a credible job of looking surprised. But Harkham has made an arrest, he said. I laughed in his face, and the laughter was mainly from relief. He had been acting so cool, so pleased with himself. 
I'd been worried he had some ace up his sleeve, some way to cancel me out as a threat. But all he had was Ron Laskow. He looked hurt. I don't see anything funny, Tim, he said. Neither do I, I told him. Not really. Harkham's working out of desperation. He thinks he can frame Ron and he's crazy. Not necessarily, Tim. I've talked with Harkham briefly and it does all hang together. Laskow had opportunity. So did a lot of other people. Of course, and he also had just as much motive as anybody at City Hall. And he wasn't one of the people to whom you delivered your ultimatum. Believe me, Tim, we all know you don't make empty threats. None of us would... Stop it, Jordan, I said. It's one of you seven and you know it. Do you have anything sensible to talk about or should I just go away and chat with the CCG? He shrugged, not looking worried at all. I had assumed, he said, strolling across the den, that Laskow's arrest was the end of all this trouble and we'd be able to concern ourselves with the CCG from now on. He paused in front of the genealogical chart and reached up to tap it. I've left a lot of room there, he said. He turned to look at me, smiling. Think I'll make a good grandpa? He was too damn sure of himself. I said, you went to Albany to see Bruce Wheatley, the head of the CCG. Did you manage a deal? Of course not, he said. He looked back at the chart again. There were reeds listed as far back as 1734. William begat Francis, and Francis begat Hiram, and Hiram begat Lawrence, and on and on it went, until finally Jonas begat Jordan, and Jordan begat Marvin, and Marvin didn't beget anybody. I knew that bothered Jordan. Jonas had left the firm to Jordan, who would leave it to Marvin, and he wanted to know that Marvin would be leaving it to another reed. I had the feeling Jordan had managed to ignore an awful lot of Marvin's weaknesses just for this reason. I also had the feeling that Jordan was unaware that Marvin had done most of his sewing in recent years away from home. If Jordan had learned that, Marvin would have been out on his ear, and not because Jordan is a prude, which he isn't, but because Marvin could sow his wild oats only after he had fulfilled the begat requirement. Jordan turned away from the chart and amplified his last statement. The CCG, he said, is unfortunately honest. I'm glad to hear that, Jordan, I said, because I am on my way to join them. He raised an eyebrow, but seemed otherwise unruffled by my news. Tim, he said, are you sure you've thought this out? What do you think? I think there may be one or two points you haven't considered, he said. Such as? If you turn on your friends, he said, they'll turn on you. Remember, you're just as implicated as anyone else. You've withheld evidence of crimes. I shook my head. You're wrong. I can't be called on that after I've stopped withholding. The minute I turn my files over to the CCG, I'm clear. If you do this, Tim, he said, you're through in Winston. I hope you realize that. No one will be able to trust you anymore, and you have to be trusted to stay in business. Given the choice between living and being trusted, I told him, I'll pick living every time. He shrugged. All right, he said. You're going to be obstinate. I don't know why you waited to talk to me. There's nothing I can say more than what I've already said. You can say, I told him, that you guarantee to have the killer behind bars within the hour. You can say that Ron Laskow will be released one phone call from now. He shook his head. I can't do either, Tim, he said. They're contradictory, whether you like it or not, Ron Laskow is the man. At this point, it was obvious that the only thing for me to do was go away. He was harping on Ron and letting me know that he wasn't worried by anything I might do. Either he was lying, and he'd managed to wrangle a deal directly with the CCG after all, or his trip to Albany had resulted in his reaching somebody high enough in the state government to offer him protection from the reformers. All right, Jordan, I said. They asked me to talk with you. I've talked with you. Yes, you have, he said blandly. I think you ought to know, I said, that my files are in a safe place. If anything happens to me, a friend of mine will turn them over to the CCG anyway. He shrugged. As far as I'm concerned, he said, you're perfectly safe. While he was talking, there was a faint rap on the door. He frowned, called an order to come in, and the maid appeared in the doorway, white-faced and wide-eyed. Mr. Jordan, she whispered. She glanced at me and bugged her eyes at her employer some more. It was plain they both wanted me to leave. So I left.
End of chapter 23. Chapter 24 of Killing Time by Donald Westlake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 24. I raced through the house toward the front door, wondering what the maid had been so upset about, and hoping it didn't have anything to do with me. And I was all the way into the room where Allison Reed was sitting crying before I even noticed she was there. I said, whoops, and backpedaled. She looked up at me, her patrician face marred by tear stains and frown lines and a shiny nose, and she said, "'Tim Smith, what are you doing here?' "'Getting nowhere with your father-in-law,' I said. "'Him,' the first pronoun insult I'd ever heard. "'What's the matter, Allison?' I asked her. We'd never known each other very well. She wasn't a Winston girl to begin with, but something Marvin had brought back from college with his diploma— but it would have been ridiculous to call her Mrs. Reed at that moment. After the kind of son he produced in Marvin, she said bitterly, you'd think he'd be grateful there weren't any more children in the line. I looked at her closely, and now I saw that she had been crying tears of frustrated fury, not of sorrow. He's nagging at you for a grandson, huh? Me, she cried in rage. Not Marvin ever. Only me. She got to her feet, trembling with fury now, and I could see that she was delighted at the chance to do some hollering. "'Let me tell you something,' she said tightly. "'Something he doesn't seem to realize. Before you can have any children, you have to have sexual intercourse.' "'Uh,' I said. It was the most comprehensive answer to that little comment I could think of. I started edging toward the opposite door. "'Well,' uh, I said in amplification. She shook her head, rubbing her forehead with the heel of one hand. "'Oh, I'm sorry,' she said angrily. Never mind me. It was just that he came back from Albany. You'd think he was a feudal baron the way he carried on. So it was in Albany that the change had taken place. Whatever had changed that made me no longer a threat. I've got to get going, Allison, I said hastily. I'm sorry. Uh... Oh, go on, she said. I didn't mean to make a fool of myself. Go on. I went on. Outside, it was still a summer afternoon, moving slowly now toward evening. I stood on the screened-in porch for a minute, looking out at nothing in particular, thinking about how much I would have given to have heard that maid's news, and wondering just what had happened in Albany that had shuffled me out of the deck, when Reed's gardener handyman, a grizzled, toothless, disgruntled old geezer, went trotting by at what was for him top speed, pausing only to glower at me suspiciously before disappearing around the corner of the house. I left the porch and went back to the car. As I slid in behind the wheel, Art said, What's the good word, Mr. Smith? I don't think there is any, I said. I jabbed the key into the ignition, started the engine, and said, Let's all go visit Ron Laskow. You got the saw with the cake baked in it? They laughed without understanding what they were laughing about, only understanding that I had said something funny, and that I was in a dangerous mood, so it was a good idea for them to laugh. And then we drove away from Reed's house along Reed's private road through Reed's private woods and so back to McGraw's Market Road where we were stopped by three siren-blaring police cars just making the turn, and a plain-clothes detective named Ed Jason stuck his head out the window to shout, Okay, Tim, turn around and go back. Nobody leaves this property yet. Art, beside me on the front seat, said, Now what the hell is that all about? He didn't get any answers. End of chapter 24